time to jump back into three dimensions and look at surfaces and how you can sketch them. The basic notion I tried to get across last time is that if you take a surface and cut it with a plane, you get a two-dimensional curve, which you might be able to appreciate as a two-dimensional curve. And then by arranging these two-dimensional curves properly in a sketch, or at least mentally, you might have a good idea of what the surface is to look like. Last time I left you with one basic kind of surface. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot more, a few more at least today. The surface we dealt with looks something like this. Now we dealt with something very specific, but you'll find that in your book you have some general formulas, some basic equations. This one would be labeled a paraboloid. And in particular, it uh, might be an elliptical paraboloid, circular, if A and B are equal to one another. And we've done some sketches like that, but those are the kinds of techniques or topics we're going to get into and learn the techniques that are available to help us look at these objects. Uh, one thing we didn't look at, which was unfortunate because that was the name of the, the game, so to speak, last time, and that's the topic of cylinders, uh, quickly. They are a very simple type of surface. It's basically a matter of taking a curve, C, in some plane, for example, the XY plane, and denoting uh, a line as being special, not in the plane. <coughs> and then basically, I can't do it too well here, but let me run through it in your mental image first. Take this line, move it over to the curve so it's passing through the curve, and move that line parallel around the curve. What you'll generate are what are called rulings on the surface. And what you're supposed to imagine is that this surface, if you cut it anywhere, has basically, well, I shouldn't say basically, exactly the same cross-section. If you take any horizontal plane cut of that surface developed by running that blue line around the curve, you'll get exactly the same cross-section. Now that is what you call the most general cylinder that we'll have to deal with. The cylinders we actually deal with, pretty regularly anyway, are so-called right cylinders where the rulings of the surface, these uh, duplications of L over here, the rulings are perpendicular to the plane of the curve. That's a right cylinder. And of course, if this happened to be a circle, you'd have a right circular cylinder, which everyone's familiar with. In fact, most people think of that as being a cylinder, but it is, in fact, more general. A cylinder, for us, will be probably given by an equation something like this. I'll put an et cetera in here, but basically what happens is uh, one variable, in this case, z, is missing from your equation. One variable is missing. For example, if I take x squared over, let's <coughs> say, 9 plus y squared over 4, set that equal to 1. A couple of weeks ago, you would have said that, that is an ellipse. You would have been correct. But now, this is f of xy equal a constant in free space. That turns out to be a cylinder. What kind of a cylinder is it? Well. In the xy plane, which will be the curve, we have a, an ellipse running from 3, for example, over to 2 on the y-axis and all the way around. Try to put that in kind of lightly. Try to deal again with only the first octant. And what you're supposed to imagine are that your rulings are these vertical lines perpendicular to the xy plane and giving you, in fact, not a circular cylinder, but some kind of an elliptic cylinder. And of course, the book has quite an advantage over me. You'll see nice shaded figures there. They throw in a couple of traces, and then you come up here in class and say, well, why can't I see his pictures as well? It's because I don't have the shading nor the accuracy to the, to the drawing. But of course, this is what you're expected to do as best you can give someone else a feeling of what the surface is all about. Okay, so what this would be is a, an elliptic 
cylinder. Cylinder because the axis, in this case the z-axis, if you puncture it with <coughs> perpendicular plane sections, the traces turn out to be ellipses, exactly the same ellipse every time. And of course, what made this different from our paraboloid over here is when you took cross sections along the axis, you got ever-expanding ellipses. That was the bowl shape opened up like this. And that, of course, is what designates the difference between a cylinder and everything else. <coughs> cylinder cross sections are all about the same. If uh, I had x squared plus z squared, instead of x squared plus y squared, you'd still have a cylinder, but that would have cross sections perpendicular to the y-axis with the ellipse. So you can open up this uh, elliptic cylinder along any of the axes. Of course, you can translate it, rotate it. We don't get anything fancy like that. But this is what I was trying to get across is basically a cylinder will be an equation involving only two variables. Remember you're in three dimensions and it's not just a plane curve but something uh, a little bit fancier. Let's go back and talk about the conics in two dimensions. Because we're going to use those in order to generate some of the so-called quadric surfaces. That's our next section in three dimensions. A long time ago, I brought in the notion, in fact, that there was a picture in your book, of taking a cone, like circular cone, both naps. Okay, that's not a great picture, but that's the idea. And we made cuts through the cone. If it's perpendicular to the axis of the cone, we got a circle. Uh, a little bit off perpendicular, we got ellipses. They turned into parabolas. And then if you were parallel to the axis, you had hyperbolas. So it turns out that our two-dimensional conics were themselves traces. We were taking a three-dimensional surface, cutting it with planes, and generating the familiar plane conic. That picture is so bad, let me get rid of it. The conics that we looked at, for example, something like this. x squared is 4py. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1, and x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. Now, this is sort of like a multiple choice question. What is that parabola? This one? Ellipse, good. Some of you remember. And hyperbola. Let me just give you a fair sketch of what they're supposed to be like. Not necessarily all of them look this way, but there's your parabola, xy plane. Here's an ellipse. Again, xy plane. And your hyperbola. And of course, the numbers of interest were so this one, A was here, B was up here, and this one, A is here, and B is somewhere important, but let's not get into that. Now my question is, how could you make three-dimensional surfaces out of these plane figures? And one way to do it is just to uh, think of it this way. If it were a, a piece of wire here hanging by a string along the axis, you might just give it a flick and let it spin around, in this case, the y-axis, and you would generate something that has a bowl shape. And that's exactly the one we talked about last time. That would be a paraboloid. In particular, it would be circular. That is, if the axis comes down here, we know that the radius out from the axis to the surface is equal in all directions. Circular paraboloid, or a paraboloid of revolution. And we've done that one, basically, a couple of them last time anyway. How about this one? What would you do with that one? 
spin it around x or y axis. Let's go around the x axis. Not going to look much different. It's one of those situations where we'll have to look at traces or something, but just to give you kind of the flavor that it is a, an egg shape or a football shape, whatever you like, you get something that's called an ellipsoid. Again, of revolution. And what makes it a special ellipsoid is that it would have a circular cross section, a circular trace cut by something perpendicular to the axis of revolution. And what would happen if I spun it around the minor axis? Well, you get a different shape, but it's still basically an <coughs> ellipsoid. It still has a circular cross section this way with respect to the minor axis. Okay, how about the hyperboloid? What would we do that? Anybody want to suggest something? Okay, the suggestion is we spin it around the y-axis, and what you would generate, I think, is something like this. Let me make sure you see where the hyperbola comes in. It's this part right here with axis coming again down through the middle. Up here, the axis was horizontal or vertical. didn't make any difference. But that's not the only thing. How else could you spin this thing? On the x-axis. Yeah. And you get a different looking shape, no doubt about it. Uh, in this case, it's kind of like two bullet shapes facing one another. Here's your axis, in this case, looking something like this, maybe. But there, with respect to the x-axis, you get something else. Actually, it is not something else. Both of these are classified as hyperboloid. This one is said to be of one sheet because it's basically one surface connected. And this one down here is said to have two sheets. I don't know where the word sheets come from, but uh, that's the word that you'll see in your book. Still, these are circular or hyperboloids of revolution. That is, all of these basically have circles in some cross section, cross section perpendicular to the axis of revolution. That's not the, really the end of the story, it's really the beginning. What we want to do is actually algebraically, as we have here in the plane, come up with something in three space that represents not only these objects, but things that are slightly distorted. In other words, I would like to have a, an elliptical cross section here. We've already done it, in fact. I would like to have elliptical cross sections in all directions here, not necessarily circular. Same thing here, elliptical in this direction, elliptical in that direction. Okay, so we have, really, the first one that we talked about. There's your paraboloid, and in fact, it is the elliptic one that I wanted. So we're done with that particular problem. How about those other creatures? Well, let me entertain you by, again, coming back. Let's come back over here. Notice what happened was that I had what you call a standard form for an ellipse. We kind of manufactured it in class fairly well. You can read the book for the more details. What I decided was, uh, what happens if you throw in a negative sign? You can look at it that way. What happens to your ellipse in the plane if you throw in a negative sign, either here or here? Turns out you'll get a hyperbola. What if I threw in two negative signs, because this is really a plus still out front. I'm just really cooking up a little bit of the game. You know, what happens algebraically if you do certain things, as opposed to geometrically? what happens when you do certain things. Okay, what if you throw in another negative sign? What would that figure right there be? Does anyone think of a pair of numbers that are going to work? A 
okay, you're thinking of it geometrically, let me push algebra some more. Plug in some numbers. Nothing is the answer, exactly. So in other words, you can write down equations that are meaningless. If you put any number over here, x and y, any numbers over here, uh, at best you'll get zero, at worst you'll get something that's completely negative. And we're supposed to have it equal to one, it's not possible. So throwing in negative signs uh, can be fun, but it doesn't really produce some things all the time. Let's kind of do the same thing here. There was my original ellipse, if I set that equal to 1. And what's been the story about going from two dimensions to three dimensions? I haven't said it for a while, but adding in an extra term. And you probably could guess it. If you throw in a z squared over c squared, you'll have an ellipsoid. Just simply throw in an extra term, my z squared over c squared in this particular case. Real quick, we'll come back and do a specific example, but just follow my, faster than uh, possible maybe, but follow my hand. If I let z equal 0, I'm looking at a surface trace in the xy plane. It happens to be an ellipse. If I let y equal 0, I'm in the xz plane. The trace is an ellipse. Same in the yz plane. So each of the coordinate planes have elliptical cross-sections. Maybe you'll believe that it's an ellipse then. Again, we'll come back and look at a specific example. What I want to do now is throw in some negative signs. This was, as we just remembered, the negative right there was a hyperbola in two dimensions. Throw in the extra term, and you get an hyperboloid. But there was no reason just to throw in a plus. I could have also thrown in a negative z squared over c squared. Okay, I have a choice here, it turns out. And it turns out you still get a hyperboloid. In fact, these are the two that I talked about over there. And there's a little mnemonic. That is, if there's one negative sign there, it will be a hyperboloid of one sheet, two negative signs, two sheets. Okay, that might ask, well, might make you ask, although no one seems to be asking, why didn't I throw in a negative sign up here? You know, I could have thrown in a negative z squared over c squared. You'd still get a hyperboloid, exactly. I'd have one negative and two positives. Really doesn't make much difference where they occur. It changes the orientation of the hyperboloid. But if you have one negative and two positives, you're going to get a hyperboloid of one sheet in some direction. So when I didn't put a negative in here, it was for a per uh, perfectly good reason. You have to have all pluses for ellipsoids, and you have to have one or two negatives for hyperboloids. What if I throw in all three negatives? <coughs> What happens if you play that game? It's just like the two-dimensional case. This is a big zip. So those are the classic surfaces that you get from playing that kind of a game. Now, I kind of want to go on a little bit further. Those were all set equal to 0. A uh, 1, pardon me. What if I set them equal to 0? I'm still doing an algebraic game here. What, what might that be? Rather than a 1, I'm going to put a 0 over here and look at the whole, most of those equations. What kinds of x, y's, and z's can satisfy that? Origin. Right, exactly. One point, the origin. And that's not too interesting. OK, what if I start throwing in a negative sign or two? It's a little hard to see, but this will turn out to be something famous. A cone, actually an elliptic cone, 
that is, cross-sections to its axis will be ellipses. Now what I'm going to do next to kind of complete out the story is, what if I drop one of the variables down to a first power and either add or subtract it. Rather than putting in a second power, one of the variables will be to a first power. Well, that we had on the board already. Pardon? It's going to be a plane moved up and down the x-axis. Not, not a plane. That's only... I mean, if we have that would be if all three variables were to the first power. Oh, okay. If you've got two variables squared, one to the first, we come back to roughly this situation right here. Two squared, one to the first power in that form means I've got two parabolas in a couple of directions, ellipse in the third. That's elliptic paraboloid again, so we're back to a paraboloid. And last, least of the things that we want to consider, what if I've put in two negative signs, plus or minus? We can absorb the sign there with, with the C. It doesn't make any difference. Before, it did make a difference because we had a C squared that would have to be a positive number, but now it can be negative. That one, you're not supposed to know it unless you've read the book very carefully. That's called a, an elliptic... Hyper uh, parabolic, hyperbolic, gee, I can't remember. Something like this. The reason I can't remember is because it's got a more famous name. This is called a saddle surface. And that's the one, of course, I remember it by. It turns out to be a saddle surface. It's hyperbolic in some directions, parabolic in another or two and you get something that looks like that. We had that up on uh, a picture. As long as we're talking about it, let me throw it up one more time for you. It's that saddle surface right there. If you let stare at it for a while, you can imagine that you see maybe parabolas in a couple of directions, like right here. And there's a, of course that would be where the horn to the back of the saddle goes. There's also parabolas going this way, where you put your legs. But if you cut through it with a, a bunch of horizontal planes, you get some, uh, what did I say, hyperbole. Okay. Supposedly you get hyperbole over there. That's hard to see. In this particular picture, there are no horizontal traces, so that's kind of hard to establish that you have hyperbole. Now, that is the general framework. I'm not asking you to be you know, so, uh, so good that you can look at this and immediately say hyperboloid, although it would be nice and it would be good if eventually you can do that. This is by no means a complete set of problems. If nothing else, I can always say, well, down here, I could interchange x with z. That's still a paraboloid, but the orientation is different. It's a different surface. And, of course, there are a few other games I haven't played with. Uh, what happens if I... I've got two first powers and a second power, things of that nature. So it's not complete, but it certainly is a good cross-section of all kinds of surfaces, and basically the ones that you'll ever see in this course or subsequent courses. Let me finish up by saying that over here, when we talked about the circular paraboloid, circular ellipsoid, and circular hyperboloid as special cases. Those were situations where a couple of these denominators were equal. If A equals B, then you would have a circle in the XY plane. That would be the circular cross-section. 